Welcome everyone to HESI's Environmental Epidemiology Committee's webinar series. Uh, today's uh, webinar is will be given by Dr. Paolo Bofetta, um, and his talk is entitled Evidence Integration in Epidemiology and Risk Assessment. Uh, just before we hand the um, the presentation rights over to him, just wanted to share a little bit more about the HESI Environmental Epidemiology Committee for those who may not be uh, familiar or aware of what we do. Um, our mission is to engage stakeholders from across all sectors and relevant expertise in the development of a strategy to increase the use of epidemiological data in risk assessment and regulatory decision making. Um, one of the things that the committee is working on is um, a, a new website that you see the link there for below, um, Epifora, and um, we'd like to grow this community of practice. Um, and what Epifora is, it's really Epidemiology for Risk Assessment. Um, it is a web platform that compiles information pertinent to epidemiology and risk assessment. Um, the goal is to facilitate communication and collaboration among professionals and trainees to create a strong community of practice. We'd like to, it, it aims to be a multi-sectorial and cross-disciplinary publicly accessible repository of stakeholders interested in strengthening in the use of environmental epidemiology in human health risk assessment and decision making. So we encourage all of um, the attendees to, to take a look and um, participate. Uh, a few webinar logistics. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. It will be posted to the Environmental Epidemiology Committee pe page on the HESI website that you see there. Um, we ask that you use the question box to type in your questions and they will be read um, and moderated at the end of um, Paolo's presentation. Uh, if you have any questions about this HESI project or the webinar, feel free to contact uh, Sandrine Deglin, the primary manager, um, and information about future websites will also be posted to the committee webpage. And just a very quick disclaimer that the views expressed by Paolo and others are on the webinars are those of the speakers and the third party and not necessarily those of HESI. And I think with that, um, Igor, I think you were going to do a quick introduction for Paolo. Uh, yes. So good afternoon or good evening, everybody, wherever, whichever time zone you folk happen to be. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Paolo to this group. Um, he is currently a professor in the Department of Family Population Preventive Medicine of uh, Stony Brook University, as well as Associate Director for Population Sciences at the Stony Brook uh, uh, cancer Center. He graduated in medicine from University of Turin and obtained a master's of public health at Columbia University. He worked at the American Cancer Society in New York, the International Cancer International Agency of Research on Cancer, which is part of World Health Organization in Lyon, which is uh, where we met. Uh, he also worked at the German Cancer Research Center in Heidelberg, Germany, as well as Econ School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. He's a professor at the University of Bologna, Italy, and holds Anjang's professorships at several other universities, including Harvard and Vanderbilt. His main fields of research, for those who are not familiar, are cancer epidemiology and cancer prevention, with emphasis on global oncology, environmental exposures, personal behaviors, gene environment interactions, and he's as, a, as well as evidence integration, which is the focus of today's uh, presentation. Uh, he's established and coordinated numerous international consortia in cancer epidemiology and prevention, focusing on lung cancer, head and neck cancer, pancreatic cancer, uh, cohort of Asian uh, cohorts, uh, stomach cancer, as well as liver cancer. Uh, on a personal note, Paolo is somewhat responsible for reaching me into the world of epidemiology, even though I had no medical or epi training at the time. Uh, and if I tried to learn from his work how to anchor innovations in the current best practices while seeking opportunities to advance knowledge through somewhat unorthodox, perhaps, connections with uh, people and ideas that exist uh, now and may have uh, uh, credibility in the future. So with this, I give the floor to Paolo. Thank you, Paolo. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Igor, for this nice introduction. And it's really a pleasure to interact with you again in this, with this uh, opportunity. Um, I, um, I wonder whether uh, 
you can see my screen and the first slide. Uh, we this... can. So I put it in um, um, presentation mode. Is this okay? And yes, uh, uh, so, as Igor said, I really come from the field of cancer epidemiology. So most of my uh, presentation today will be around uh, um, hazard identification and risk assessment in cancer and um, uh, how epidemiology may play a, a major role. Uh, I will go through a few examples. I will start with uh, some uh, something that may be familiar to many of you who are the uh, IARC monographs. As Igor said, I spent uh, a good deal of my career at, uh, at IARC and I participated in many of the monograph meetings at that time. I will discuss some, uh, uh, um, how can I say, some more recent uh, proposals, at least, uh, if not programs, uh, which uh, are uh, sort of related to the IR monograph, but they uh, change a little bit. And then I would briefly present the SETOC framework for risk assessment because the first three uh, um, um, examples are really uh, about uh, hazard identification. Um, I have also a, a very uh, personal disclaimer, sorry, because I had some um, planning uh, issues and I'm in a, in a public setting now, but uh, it seems to be very quiet and I hope there will be no interference uh, with, with my presentation and the, and the Wi-Fi seems to be working very well. So uh, just starting with the IR monograph, which uh, um, is important, I think, for two reasons. The first one is that it was really the first attempt, I think, to formally combine uh, different lines of evidence, in this case, in terms of hazard identification for environmental carcinogens. And uh, since uh, the inception in the early 70s, the program has uh, undergo, uh, uh, has undergone a number of changes, but uh, some of the key features have remained uh, more or less constant. Um, the idea is to look separately at uh, data from uh, humans and then uh, from uh, toxicology, uh, from studies in experimental animals, and more, uh, more and more now uh, in recent years, uh, data on mode of action uh, mechanisms and, and other uh, relevant type of information. And then uh, these uh, three uh, uh, lines of evidence are first evaluated independently and then they are brought together into what is called the overall evaluation, which uh, uh, consists in classifying uh, the agent uh, into one of four categories. There are five here, but in fact, group four has now been, um, has been uh, um, Cancelled. So uh, this uh, slide is a little bit obsolete. Um, we don't have time to go obviously into the detail, uh, the monograph or any of the other programs. But uh, basically, uh, for both human data and toxicology data, the idea is to come up with a classification into four levels of evidence that you see here. Uh, they are labeled sufficient, limited, inadequate, or evidence suggesting lack of carcinogenicity. And uh, the point I want to make is that for both human data, which is this slide, and uh, experimental data, as we will see briefly uh, in the next slide, um, the criteria are, 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 are somehow, um, uh, I would say, general because for example, for sufficient evidence, the point is that there is a causal relationship for which one can rule out chance bias and compounding. So uh, the, uh, the assumption is that for environmental carcinogens, environmental agents, um, the bulk of the data, or all of the data in humans come from observational studies where uh, compounding and bias are major, are major issues. Um, and this indeed be the case with, the, with a few exceptions. Um, and then the limited evidence is, uh, has a very similar language in which uh, chance bias and confounding cannot be ruled out and the causal association has not been established, but there is some association that is 
considered to be credible. Uh, so all this is very is very sensible, I think. However, it doesn't provide more strict guidance on on how to judge whether, for example, bias and compounding is um, is ruled out, or whether um, what means to be uh, to have a credible association, how many studies you need, how many, how much replication you expect. So, in other words, this uh, criteria, which has been extremely helpful, uh, we will see a little bit of details in a minute, um, were really established when many of the considerations about uh, uh, the uh, rigor for uh, the methodological rigor for epidemiology, in particular for observational studies, were not very well uh, developed yet. And, and, and somehow this slide, in my opinion, reflects a little bit this. So these are the similar criteria for uh, classifying the evidence in uh, experimental animals here. We go a little bit more into specifics. You see, for example, sufficient evidence requires at least uh, two different species or two different sexes, GLP studies. Uh, so there are criteria that are, as I said, a little bit more explicit and the same as you see for limited evidence. I mean, again, we don't need into the details more to have a, uh, a, a general understanding of the of the approaches that are uh, uh, underlying this uh, this process and the use of mechanistic mode of action data etc uh, doesn't follow the same approach of classifying the evidence uh, but rather um, includes two lines of consideration the one one is about the strength of this data Again, consistency, uh, coherence of the database. These are, as you see, the language here start to become a little bit more uh, close to uh, uh, what is now considered, you know, uh, standard criteria for causality. Because all this part of the monograph program, the mechanistic part, was developed in more recent years, in the 90s, and then in the uh, at the turn of the century. And then the second line of considerations is whether the mechanism that has been shown in, in animals is, uh, is relevant to humans. Um, but again, there are no very quantitative or specific uh, um, rules. And then uh, probably this type of slide is familiar in one way or the other to, to many of you. This is the way um, the two lines of evidence from humans, these are the rows table and the animals, these are the columns, are combined to get into these uh, categories of overall evidence, which are the famous group 1 to 80 degree of higher. This is the default evaluation, which uh, human data take uh, priority. As you see, the, uh, uh, the, the red part of the panel, uh, ev uh, whenever human data are considered sufficient for carcinogenicity, um, the agent goes into group one, in, no matter what the animal data tell us. And the animal data start to play a role if the evidence in humans is less than sufficient. For example, if it's considered limited, it depends whether the evidence in animals is uh, strong enough to be considered sufficient evidence of carcinogenesis in animals. In this case, the combination is here, this orange panel, otherwise, if it's less than sufficient in animals, it goes usually to group 2B, and so on. I mean, it doesn't really, now we don't have to go into the detail, but these are just the, the sort of the key elements. Um, and then the mechanistic mode of action data come into play in a way after this, uh, uh, somehow after this mechanistic default type of evaluation, and you see that uh, there are criteria by which uh, evidence can be, I mean, the group, uh, the overall evidence, I mean, the, the, the final classification can be upgraded or in some cases, in one case at least, downgraded, depending on uh, how strong the mechanistic data are in terms of the strength of the, of the evidence and relevant to, to humans. For example, if, um, just to take this class, the most classic example, an agent that should be classified in 2A, because of sufficient evidence in animals and limited in humans, can be upgraded to group one if there is strong evidence that the mechanism that caused the classification in animals also operates in humans. And I will 
come back to this in a minute. So, so far, there has been a bit more than 1,000 agents which have been evaluated once or more than one time. And you have here the, their distribution. So, there are 121 agents. 121 recognized human carcinogens, you can say. And these 121 have been classified in group one for the vast majority because of evidence from traditional epidemiological cohort studies, sometimes also case control studies, not very often, but in a few cases, case control studies were considered sufficiently uh, strong and consistent, etc., to, to allow uh, this classification. Um, but in most instances, these are uh, agents for which we have strong uh, core studies, like uh, occupational cohorts, etc. So 96 out of 121. Uh, another 11 star, uh, agents were classified in group one, also based only on human data, but based on some biomarker type of measurement. And in fact, nine of them are the infectious agents, in which obviously the the strongest, strongest evidence comes from studies which are based on either the detection of the agent, the virus, or whatever, or some um, validated by markers such as antibodies, etc. The remaining 14 agents are those which are probably most interesting for us because these are the agents that uh, were not, uh, these are the agents without sufficient evidence in humans but for which there was some mechanistic data that brought them, pushed them up into group one. And I have a list of these uh, 14. It's obviously a little bit uh, long to review all of them. Uh, you have here the, uh, as the evidence, the classification for humans, inadequate or limited. And obviously these are, in vast majority, animal carcinogens. And these are the mechanisms that have been shown to operate both in animals and in humans. What I want to stress is that, well, for acetaldehyde is, uh, is somehow related to the genetic epidemiology, uh, the studies in uh, Asian populations which are deficient for the uh, ALDH2 uh, gene. So it's a sort of special case, but then most of the other agent that have been upgraded, uh, the mechanism really goes down to, to boils down to um, genotoxicity, sometimes adding some um, cytogenetic abnormalities, so stachromatic changes, micronuclei, sometimes DNA adders, but you see that basically genotoxicity seems to be the type of mechanism that has been the easiest to recognize both in humans and in, in animals. So these are the first five, then we go to the next page. Again, you see basically all these four agents, oxide, so an environmental occupation agent, etoposide is a, is a drug, is a chemotherapy agent, MOCA is a related, it's a one of the aromatic amines, NMK and NN are um, tobacco specific person. All these are, again, classified in group one without human data, strong enough human data, because of some interaction with DNA, including both uh, adduct formation, um, gross abnormalities, like uh, 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 cytogenetic uh, alterations, etc. In some cases, there are also non-DNA uh, mechanism, uh, so like uh, uh, hemoglobin adders, adders to form to proteins like ATV oxide and some of these tobacco-specific metrics. This is the last part of the, of the list. Here we have a couple of agents, the PCBs and uh, um, interchlorodibenzofurans uh, that uh, are classified in group one because of the uh, their uh, likely action through the AH receptor, which is basically uh, similar to what has been shown also for dioxin for PCB. But again, apart from uh, this, uh, we have uh, uh, ultraviolet, no, ultraviolet radiation is an interesting a uh, case because this is the only one where we have uh, strong enough data on, on a specific gene mutation, which is uh, this c uh, uh, transition in certain, in certain um, 
part of the of the infected region uh, that is found in both uh, uh, humans and in animals exposed to to UV. So uh, you have a, a very quick idea of which type of mechanistic data has been used, at least in the IR program, as uh, to sort of support limited epidemiological data. But as, I, as we have seen, the vast majority of human carcinogens classified as such by IR uh, were uh, listed in group one because of strong, uh, strong epidemiology. Now, I will shift now to a second example, which is uh, the so-called EPITOX framework, which was proposed now about 10 years ago by this group of epidemiologists and, uh, and toxicologists. Uh, to, my to my knowledge, this has never really been uh, applied in, in, uh, in, in real life, but I want just to briefly mention it because it shows, as, as I was saying at the beginning, somehow the evolution of the thinking about uh, data and evidence integration that took place from the 70s, 80s, when the higher monograph was started up to the present time, or up to 10 years ago. So um, here the idea is also to look at the two sets of data separately, uh, having some uh, somehow parallel criteria, as you see here, we have those exposed, which is applied to both the uh, animal and the human data. I mean, they are considered into, into, the, into the process, uh, time uh, latency, time related factors, and then we have things like mode of action for animals and biological plausibility, which relates somehow also to the mechanistic data in the IR monographs, etc. So there are some, see most of the uh, most of the criteria are, are sort of uh, specular between human and animal data. But the interesting aspect, I think, compared to the there are two interesting aspects compared to the IR monograph. I'm not saying that this is necessarily superior what i'm saying is that it reflects a different somehow a different um, logical framework the first is that there is a more explicit way to uh, collect the data so there are guidelines in order to uh, go for a systematic review uh, you should consider that the whole area of systematic review coming from from the cochrane collaboration really stemming from the clinical trials and then moving slowly into um, observational and clinical studies um, really uh, is, uh, has developed in the last 20, 25 years. So uh, nowadays uh, it would be uh, unthinkable, I think, to, to, to try to uh, uh, provide some overall classification, for example, for carcinogenicity or some other effect without basing uh, this whole work on a, on a sort of systematic review. Yet, if you look at the, at the monograph, there is no real provision to, to conduct a systematic review, although we all know, for, I mean, all the people who have been involved know that there's been, there, there is a very big effort to try to get all the, all the literature. But I think this idea of, of, of uh, becoming explicit in terms of, you know, how to uh, collect, how to uh, classify and how to assess the quality of the studies according to specific guidelines. All this is really part of, of, a, of, a, of a new way of thinking about uh, uh, assessing and integrating evidence. So basically, this particular example uh, proposed to classify studies both for animals and for humans into three uh, levels of quality, acceptable, so what they call supplementary, and then uh, the low quality uh, studies. And then uh, for humans, there is a weight of evidence approach and for uh, and the same for animals, although for animals, there is a secondary step, which is whether uh, the effect shown in animal is, uh, is, is uh, relevant to humans. So uh, based on the mechanistic, mechanistic data. And then the integration itself is based on a slightly different approach than IR because somehow the data here are given the two set of data the two sets of data, uh, human and toxicology, are, are given the same, uh, how can I say, the same uh, dignity. Uh, so you see there are basically uh, um, on, the, on, the, on the horizontal axis, uh, the uh, weight of evidence sort of evaluation for uh, the human AP data from uh, strong in favor to uh, strong against. And on the vertical axis, the same for um, animal data from 
high strong evidence with high biological plausibility to low evidence. So you can identify these four areas of the graph. Uh, the one on the top uh, right obviously has very uh, uh, represent you know uh, situations where there is a high likelihood of, of causal causality. The one on the low uh, low uh, left side obviously has very unlikely, and then you have many uh, various possibilities. Um, and then there are some uh, supplemental. Uh, well, this is just no sorry. This is just to show uh, uh, go a little bit more to, into the details of these steps. But I don't think we have time to. To, to spend too much time to spend on this, uh, except for to say that again, for uh, also for quality assessment, the idea is to refer, as I mentioned before, to some uh, explicit uh, guidelines like the ESETOF 2009 uh, document that I will mention briefly later for epidemiology and uh, some of the EPA uh, documents for the quality of the animal studies. Well, this is the weight of evidence, which is probably known to many of you, and this is uh, the uh, uh, algorithm for uh, assessing the relevance to humans, but I don't think we need to go into much details here. So, uh, this is the final step of this approach, is, uh, which is uh, the key aspect I mentioned already, the fact that the conclusion, the integration of the evidence should be explicit and should be as quantitative as possible along these two, <laughs> along these two uh, dimensions. So, so that's, that's uh, the graph we saw before. And here there are some examples, uh, e EMF and brain tumors, for example, was, uh, was downgraded here because of low epidemiological uh, credibility, uh, HHV8 and, uh, sorry, HIV and CAPOZ was upgraded because of the high biological positivity for animal data. I mean, I don't think we need to spend too much time here, but this is just to give a few examples. As I said, however, I don't think this has ever been used in, in real life. The third example I want to mention may be less known to all of you because it's really not on environmental agents, but was developed for genetic epidemiology. This is a set of guidelines which was developed by a working group I was part of. You see now 15 years ago, John Yalidis was a board leader. And the idea was to uh, assess the epidemiological evidence in terms of causality for uh, genetic associations, how much evidence we need to conclude that a given gene or a given variant or whatever is causally associated with a given disease or, or conditions. So it's a little different type of question, but many of the considerations are, are, are similar. And I want to mention this approach, although I will go past through the slide, uh, because it's really, uh, uh, we really put a big, uh, big effort to try to be as explicit as possible in uh, providing guidelines in terms of uh, evaluating the strength and the consistency, et cetera, of the evidence. So what we did was to go uh, into three steps. The first is to assess the epidemiological credibility. So we really start from human data here again. Um, so we give preeminence to human data and we uh, identify three dimensions to look for this credibility. One is the amount, the second is the replication, the third is protection from bias. So you see, you see really we, we, we are moving here into more specific aspects of the epidemiological data or uh, uh, of, the, of the summary of the epidemiological data that need to be taken into consideration. And, and for each of these three, there is a, 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 we gave a three level sort of assessment, A, B, C. Uh, a means uh, very strong for each of these three. B, intermediate, C obviously means weak. And when we have triple A in this particular case, it means that we have strong uh, amount, strong replication, strong protection from bias. The overall evidence for, from human data was considered to be strong. So the epidemiological credibility was strong. And if, and only if this epidemiological credibility is strong, then uh, it's uh, the recommendation, the guideline is to move to discuss uh, the integration with uh, 
non-human data, so uh, biological plausibility, and then to move into clinical and public health reports. So you see, really, this is a little bit a different, uh, a different angle to look at to look at the data, to look at data. So how we can define uh, amount of evidence? How can we say uh, high, intermediate, or low amount of evidence? And uh, we try to provide uh, indications for possible thresholds that can be met in terms of sample size, uh, studies taking into consideration the power of the studies, including um, the, uh, uh, the issue of multiple comparison and therefore the FDR type of, type of consideration. Obviously, we need to take into account the frequency of the variant because uh, more re rare variants need to have, you know, bigger uh, databases. Et there are issues, obviously, it's not, it's not straightforward. I don't need, I would not go with it. it obviously into the detail, but the point is that we really gave a sort of much more explicit guidance. The same for replication. We said we want to have to see some uh, some uh, results of, of uh, testing for heterogeneity, for example, like the I square or other methods. And also uh, considerations about the distribution of the gene in the populations, you know, uh, how comparable the studies are in terms of you know genotyping phenotyping etc and there are obviously reasons as we all know in epidemiology reasons by which uh, which uh, uh, explain why results may not be fully consistent in the case of genetic studies it can be issues in terms of gene environment interactions if the gene acts in in interacts with some environmental factor that may be distributed differently heterogeneity uh, haplotype structure population. I mean, again, there are reasons why, uh, but again, uh, the effort here was to make this consideration explicit and ask people to address them, you know, in, in, the, in their range. The same for protection from bias. We really try to provide a, a sort of quite, quite explicit information and, and guidance on how bias in terms of uh, uh, phenotype measurement, genotype measurement, confounding, etc., should be uh, addressed in uh, in individual studies or in meta analysis. Uh, well, uh, I don't think we need to to go into detail. We have some automatic check that should be done uh, always when we look for bias. Uh, and here, uh, these are one of the many tables we prepare try to address. You know, the major bias in genetic epidemiology from the definition of the phenotype bias in the in the genotype in population classification etc and and uh, these different components of the bias and how uh, likely is it that these were addressed or not addressed in the genetic study and this is one of the few examples of the application of this criteria this was done uh, about 10 years ago uh, by paolo vinais and, and his collaborators these are uh, uh, genes involved in dna here, this is just part of the big table they can use. You see, you recognize some of the genes like DRC1, DRC2, CHEC2, etc. Uh, these are the classic uh, DNA repair, uh, repair, uh, ERCC1, etc. And these are the different variants in these genes that had at least, um, uh, I think, three or five studies or whatever. And whenever there was this uh, combination of gene and uh, and uh, cancer, for example, you see for breast cancer, there were many of the genes that have been studied quite extensively. Uh, there was a, an attempt to classify the evidence according to the criteria. And in fact, only for a few variants in DRCA1 and DRCA2, the evidence was considered strong, the epidemiological credibility. These are the, the blue boxes here. And, and you see there is a lot of white, which means there's no data. And the few combinations where there were data tended to be pretty weak. So uh, maybe we were too demanding in, in this uh, criteria for genetic epidemiology, or uh, by making things more explicit and more systematic, uh, probably becomes more difficult really to get into the very the top level type of uh, evidence. Well, uh, there are a few additional slides on the on the next step in this process, but I don't think we need to spend much time here. Oh no, maybe maybe one thing is important because. Even for biological plausibility, there was a second step. If you remember, if the AP data were strong enough, then one should consider AP uh, biological plausibility. Here, we also try to provide 
explicit and quantitative guidelines on how this uh, could be could be assessed in terms of strength and consistency or the biological effects in both in humans and in animals, the amount of data, again, you know, number of studies, etc. Uh, relevance of the biological system. So uh, extent of replication, again, similar to what we did for the AP data, we were trying to do it also for the, for the uh, toxicology or whatever experimental data that we are doing. Okay, um, the last uh, 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 example that I would describe very, very briefly, I don't want to go much beyond the I would like to really leave some time for, for, for discussion is the, uh, is, is the, is the one on, on risk assessment because what we've seen so far is mainly about uh, hazard identification. Um, so uh, this is uh, the framework proposed by ESITOC in, in Europe. Uh, this is very much focused on industrial chemicals. Um, the idea was, again, quality aspect in humans, quality aspect in animal data. Um, this, again, advanced, I think, uh, approach in which you see there were a number of uh, criteria or guidance that, uh, or criteria that had to be sort of uh, evaluated, uh, the evidence should be evaluated against in, in reaching the conclusion. So appropriateness of study design, for example, appropriateness of the, of the unexposed or the, or the control group, uh, latency issues, adjustment for, for uh, confounders again protection for bias very similar to what we have seen about the genetic AP criteria uh, statistical uh, considerations in terms of power and appropriate uh, statistical analysis and uh, and uh, obviously there, there was this uh, component about uh, uh, quality of data both in exposure and um, Okay, so this goes back to the most classic aspect of uh, risk assessment. So there is not much new here, I would say. It really uh, goes down, uh, goes back to the classic uh, uh, EPA uh, derived you know, type of risk assessment. Um, however, uh, even for uh, some of these uh, aspects, like for example, the dose response assessment, uh, there were again a number of uh, aspects the data that need to be need to be evaluated, and and there is some overlap uh, as you see here from uh, with, uh, with some of the EPA approaches. Although I think the uh, interesting uh, aspect of this set of uh, framework is that again they tend to be a little bit more quantitative things, and then they have this uh, uh, comparison of uh, I mean uh, assessment of the quality of the data. On the, vertical, I mean, on the rows, and on the uh, type of effect, so whether it's uh, subchronic or chronic or acute and it's specific or not specific. And, and, and the combination of the two makes, you know, the quality of this overall evidence more or less strong in terms of ability to provide uh, uh, evidence for, for risk assessment. Obviously, if you have high quality, uh, it uh, doesn't really matter the type of effect. If you have good or, or, or intermediate quality, then it, it needs to be, uh, it's easier to get to high quality if it is acute and if it is specific. Okay, well, this I think is fairly reasonable. So um, this is an example of high quality score for human data. And obviously uh, there is the, the classic uh, hierarchy of human studies, experimental then, uh, Prospective longitudinal and then retrospective. And then we have the other consideration that <coughs> somehow it needs to affect status quo. Okay. Uh, I don't think, again, we need to go into much uh, details, uh, but uh, you see there are, uh, for example, here for assessing uh, um, the overall quality score, and group, it needs to have no more than three of these uh, factors of these characteristics that will not be met. I mean, no more than three limitations in terms of uh, this uh, IDS. Okay, I think we can we can skip all this. Uh, regarding uh, animal data, uh, there was the issue of reliability, uh, relevance, and uh, adequacy. This was uh, the three components that were uh, included in terms of uh, need for, for assessment. Uh, and uh, 
the reliability basically refers to the quality of, of the studies. Uh, relevance means really the appropriateness for the type of uh, health effect that uh, the type of toxicity that we are looking for and adequacy, uh, whether they are helpful in terms of dose response or risk assessment. Uh, well, this is one of the uh, one of the background material that was used to to come up, you know, with this uh, reliability assessment again. We don't need to, to go into detail here. Um, so, uh, the integration of the results of human studies and animal study was not is not terribly convincing. I think this is the weakest part of the of the asymptotic guide, at least in my in my opinion. However, they try to address basically consistency across, you know, uh, individual studies, target organs, and, uh, and similar studies, etc. and then try to understand when uh, discordant results are, are reported in the literature in terms of, you know, mode of action, etc. Um, I think we can, we can skip this. Um, regarding the mode of action, they mainly um, were, were uh, referring to the work done by the uh, British group coordinated by Alan Bobis, uh, uh, in which they were assessing the weight of evidence. It's very much, it's very similar to what was done by the APIC talks approach you mentioned before. Uh, I think Alan was part of that, of that committee as well. So uh, in terms of mode of action, I think this is really what, what has been produced in terms of uh, thinking, what the symmetry seems relatively uh, straightforward. Um, in terms of relevance of uh, animal data to humans, this uh, particular approach was referring to the IPCS uh, framework. So, um, which, as I said, this part to me is a little bit weaker. Probably there was not a very strong effort to make it more explicit and, and quantitative, or maybe it's, 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 a difficult, it's a difficult area, really. So there were considerations like, you know, qualitative difference between animals and humans in terms of this particular uh, mechanism of, uh, of uh, uh, toxicity, whatever, carcinogenicity, and then differences not so much in terms of qualitative, uh, really different mechanism, but more in terms of uh, dynamic or kinetic uh, factors. But again, I, 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 I'm not fully satisfied you know, by, the, by this approach. I found it a little bit vague uh, to a large extent. And then this was uh, the sort of classification that could be, could be uh, used for, class, for, the, for this uh, um, relevance of the humans. Uh, okay, this is the overall thing to do. And then there is the dose out extrapolation, the integration. I, I don't think uh, we need to go into, into much detail really because I think we got a sort of feeling of, uh, of uh, data. But the point is that uh, at the end, there will be an assessment of the quality as human data, as we have seen before, a similar assessment for animal data. And then depending on how strong uh, the evidence is in humans or in animals, uh, the idea would be to use either one or the other set of data as a guidance for, for um, risk assessment. Obviously, if the human data are poor, let's say category D or X, which means missing, uh, obviously there is no, uh, nothing we can do beyond you know, using the other data. Okay, so uh, I, I went really quickly through a few examples. Um, I think we can draw some general conclusion. The first is that uh, for causal, uh, causality and hazard identification, there are established frameworks that work more or less well. And uh, at least in the case of the higher model that has been used quite a lot. Interestingly, there is not so much in, in for other type of uh, health effects. For risk assessment, at least uh, in my, my understanding, there is much less experience in terms of developing frameworks. There is work done by EPA, there is this work by SETOC, but um, I think uh, there has been less, uh, uh, at least in my, my, uh, my understanding, a, less, a, a minor effort to really move this uh, uh, field forward. Obviously, human data tend to take uh, preeminence, although we have seen the APIC talks framework which is the one where probably the two sets of data are, are, are given sort of a, a more even type of 
uh, importance, but in the eye of monograph, in the Venice criteria, in the asymptotic assessment, human data, user take. I mean, they are they clearly have a, a pro prominence, which you know is, is is framed in different in different ways. What I think is important, however, is the third point here. So the fact that uh, um, I've noticed that as time uh, move as years have passed, you know, from the 80s to the 90s, etc., there has been a, an effort really to make more explicit, more transparent, reproducible, reproducible um, guidelines, you know, to integrate, to assess and integrate uh, the evidence both for hazard and education risk assessment. Uh, and I think this is a very uh, positive and very healthy uh, approach, which, as I said, mentioned before, quickly to me, in my opinion, is really part of, of a larger effort to make, you know, more uh, um, uh, a systematic uh, attempt, you know, to, to integrate data in, in, in different fields of, of health sciences. And then the last two points are relatively straightforward. I mean, obviously, these guidelines need to be uh, flexible and may adapt as, as knowledge advances. And as I said before, most of the work has been done really in the field of cancer, to some extent also reproductive toxicity, but not so much as some of the other chronic uh, chronic conditions. And I stop here, and uh, I hope I didn't spend too much time, and I'd be happy to take, to take questions. Uh, thank you, Paolo. This is Igor. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll, 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 I'll thank you very much for this uh, overview uh of competing approaches uh i'll ask first question from the audience uh, uh, and this really hopefully will allow you to elaborate how this uh, process for risk hazard identification and risk assessment uh would differ for non-cancer outcomes as opposed to carcinogens uh, you know, uh, how do we weigh this uh, fear and threat and, uh, and apprehension about cancer as opposed to other uh, other outcomes? Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. And I've been thinking a little bit about this. Um, uh, let me say a couple of things. Um, in general, I think the database on human uh, studies on cancer tend to be usually stronger than for other uh, health effects. There are a few other areas like cardiovascular disease where we have uh, quite a large number of high quality studies that may be comparable to some of the some of the uh, some of the data we have for, for cancer, you know, large cohorts, etc. Uh, so I think for for cardiovascular and possibly um, chronic respiratory effects, COPDs, etc. Uh, for a number of agents, we may have a quite a strong database. For many other chronic conditions, even important diseases like diabetes, for example, uh, from what I understand, the data are much weaker because there are bigger issues. Well, I think one big uh, advantage, if you want to put it this way, of cancer in terms of AP studies is that uh, the definition of the phenotype tend to be more uh, reliable and more standardized. You know, uh, most of cancers are diagnosed through some some sort of pathological review. Um, obviously, the quality may not be the same in different studies, blah blah. blah but by and large, there are uh, pathology data available for most of the cases, even those who are, are diagnosed maybe even only on death certificates, etc. Uh, this is not the case for most of the other diseases. You know. Um, even if you go to some, I've been doing some work on some extreme, extremely difficult disease to phenotype, like IBD, for example, inflammatory bowel disease, where uh, there is really no biomarker, no standard uh, laboratory uh, or even imaging technique. And there is a, a, a large amount of subjectivity of the doctor, in particular the GI specialist, to, to, to Diagnose. So uh, when you deal with these other conditions, obviously the quality of the data set would be much weaker and it would be very difficult to go beyond the very first steps in these processes, the type of uh, processes that I outlined. So I think uh, cancer is an important disease, is a major cause of death, blah, blah, but also intrinsically has better human data, I think, 
compared to most of the other important therapies. The only except, exception may be reproductive toxicity because data on malformation on uh, reproductive outcomes, you know, spontaneous abortion and the different indicators of, of health of the of the newborn, etc. They tend to have pretty good quality. So that's probably the other area where we have relatively good data. But beyond these two, I think we go into more uh, confused territories, you know, where you really don't know what we are talking about. So now. So, so we would either need to relax criteria or lower our expectations about certainty in these procedures. I don't know if this is the answer or, or just try to or 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 or, or uh, sort of argue to get you know better quality data, you know, more standardized, you know, in, in large courts or whatever. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, I'll read the next question on that. Uh, so in Modern Epidemiology by Rothman, Lash, and Greenland, third edition, there was a full chapter 33 on meta-analysis and systematic review, specifically for epidemiology studies. Uh, uh, epidemiology studies, uh, was, was that overlooked or do you have any comments uh, on uh, kind of those approaches? Um, no, that's a good point. Well, by the way, not only in the in the Rothman textbook, I think everybody really recognizes the importance of. Uh, as I said, this part to me is part of this uh, um, general tendency, which I think is very healthy toward more uh, uh, formalized, more explicit ways, you know, to summarize the evidence. Having said that. Meta-analyses are not the panacea. I mean, uh, first, uh, a meta-analysis can be only as good as the underlying studies. You know, if the studies are bad or are highly heterogeneous, uh, it's not by doing a meta-analysis that you address. That it's not through a meta-analysis that you get better results, or you get a result, some result, but they don't necessarily seem to be to be true. So. Um, Although I, I'm very, I'm very uh, much in favor of, of meta-analysis, and I've done a number of those myself, uh, it's very important to, to recognize that they are not a, 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 a solution for, for poor quality of the primary, of the primary studies. Um, the second point, I think, is that uh, um, meta-analysis can be uh, can obfuscate somehow important aspect of heterogeneity that may be important, in particular if you want to discuss um, mode of action or uh, interactions or, or these sort of aspects. You know, I mean, inter, uh, uh, how can I say more more uh, secondary type of results beyond you know the, the main result that can be brought into the meta analysis, and, and oftentimes this. Uh, stratified results, uh, whatever, tend to be very informative in terms of, for example, the set mode of action or, or, or other um, reasons for heterogeneity, etc. So again, a meta-analysis is, is a very powerful tool, it's a very important tool, but needs to be used with a, with a grain of salt and moderation. I mean, it's not just by throwing results and coming out with a meta-analysis if it's not done. Uh, um, no, I, I'm not saying it's not done Properly, but it's not interpreted properly. That it is not necessary to achieve. That would be my answer here. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Paolo. Uh, I was very intrigued to see clinical and public health important as one of the rubrics in the Venice criteria. Uh, to me, that you know that, that seems to be huge and a, and a massive advance over sort of historical approaches could you talk a little bit about how this was approached uh, systematically and where you see that thinking evolving yeah okay i have to say that i i also like this this aspect although we didn't really spend too much time to discuss this so we out of the three aspects which was the Evaluation of the credibility, I mean, the evaluation of the AT database for the genetic AT the credibility. Then the biological plausibility, which means basically an integration with whatever animal or mechanistic data, depending on the, which gene we're talking about. And then the third was to bring it to the real world. So, how this uh, 
uh, variant, how the gene impact, you know, disease in the terms of clinical uh, impact or public health or whatever. Impact. And we wanted to develop sort of uh, somehow quantitative and, and a clear criteria, but if you read the paper that we published, uh, this last part is really uh, not very well developed. And the idea was, okay, this is work for the next uh, for the next phase, which never came because, as I said, very, very few genes really survived, you know, this strict criteria uh, that showed. And then also, uh, shortly after we published this, uh, the uh, GWAS study and then the sequencing uh, start to appear, so now the, the picture of genetic epidemiology has really changed a little bit, although I think some of the ideas at the basis of the various criteria are still, are still quite, quite valid. But to go back to your question, Igor, I think that's an important aspect that may be developed also for the classic environmental uh, AP type of thing. So it's one thing to say that, you know, tobacco is a carcinogen for this or that type of organ. Another thing is to say that uh, one particular uh, occupational agent that is no longer used or is used in, in uh, extreme uh, control circumstances, you know, because the public health impact of this will be uh, extremely different. Uh, so it's, I think somehow uh, it needs to be, uh, and it is, it is, I think, kept, but is somehow uh, done uh, downstream to the, to the evaluation. Instead, with the various criteria, we'll try to bring it into the evaluation process in a more explicit way. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next question, I, I know this has come up sometimes with uh, with NASM, National, Science, National Academy of Sciences and Engineering Medicine, as well as IRIS and OPPT. Uh, but the question is, uh, the Adami et al. framework appears to be the only framework that specifically says do not use data of unacceptable quality. Uh, is this correct? And how does the ECE uh, CTOC framework handle unacceptable quality uh, data? Well, it is not as explicit in the ESETOC, but I think that it is somehow it will lead to that thing as well. Uh, I think it was quite, uh, I think it is quite uh, 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 bold. I think it's quite uh, um, um, important, I think, to, to really try to put a, a limit to the quality that can be accepted. Uh, if I go back to my experience in the IAC, uh, uh, there has been many, uh, and probably Igor, you also participated in some of the IR uh, meetings. Uh, there are each situations where we all know, everybody knows in the in the group of people who do the evaluation that that particular study is really crap, you know. And and uh, I've seen uh, different ways to handle this, uh, from just ignoring it, so without you know even quoting the the study to uh, quoting in a very short uh, thing with a, with a long comment uh, describing all the limitations, et cetera. So uh, the, the point is that in, the, in, the, in a situation like the IR monograph, there is no explicit way to, to guarantee a minimum quality, although obviously people who do the work naturally do this, you know, because you know that, you know, you can't really rely on, you cannot trust, you know, some occasionally, you know, some stuff. So to have some mechanism by which you can really come up with a quality score or whatever and decide to throw away things that are below a certain threshold, I think that's, that's a good approach, frankly, I think. Uh I'd like to wrap up the last question from the audience, which I think is, is pivotal to activity of our group, and I think it's on everybody's mind, is that how would you say the design and conduct and reporting of epi studies can be optimized or improved to make them more amenable and useful to weight of evidence well, approaches? This is how much, how many hours we have now? One minute. <laughs> well, can, how busy, you know. Uh, I, let me answer this way. I think uh, there has been, uh, if you, I, I think people are more and more uh, um, aware, you know, of the need of uh, conducting high quality AP studies, you know, whatever this means, depending on the, on the field, uh, uh, etc. cetera. Um, and, and if you look, well, we mentioned the uh, fourth edition of the Rothman textbook just uh, before the one, you know, with Tim Lash in the first video. Uh, if you look at, uh, at this uh, type of, you know, uh, fundamental tools, you know, for epidemiology, they are becoming, I think, more and more modern 
from whatever this means in terms of you know being able to really provide more explicit, more quantitative, more uh, uh, formal ways to address you know the major limitations of computing so bias, confounding, uh, low power, lack of replication, etc. So I, I'm quite optimistic, although obviously we, we keep making mistakes in uh, epidemiology, but, but uh, I think uh, overall uh, the, the quality is probably now, obviously, we cannot. People have tried to set up guidelines to, to to say you should do this and you shouldn't do that. But clearly, working in real life, you know, in observation studies, is so complex that you need to obviously adapt to, to different circumstances. But I think, in general, to me, the quality of, of the work is not is going in the right direction. I think it's moving in the right direction. Thank you very much. Thank you. So okay. Thank you very are, much for it. We are beyond the top of the hour, and I know Paolo needs to go. So thank you again, Paolo. And I know there are some additional questions. I think maybe we can pass on to you that we didn't maybe get to. Um, well, and as you guys know, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. And as you hear, the, the, this recording will be available on the HESI website um, in a few days, and we hope that you'll you'll join us um, for our next webinar. Which you see here is um, scheduled for June 29th, and it'll be a very interesting, I think, webinar um, that'll be, uh, we'll have both Dr. Tim Lash and Dr. Brian Nosek from the Center of Open Science, and they'll be discussing transparency and data sharing for epidemiology. So um, thank you, everyone. And thank you okay. again, Paolo. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. <laughs>